It stretched from the Pacific Ocean to the fringes of Western Europe. The Soviet Empire seemed invincible. But in 1989, the Iron Curtain was swept away and Moscow watched its empire crumble. Выработана точка зрения такая вот так, без крови. Thirty years on, Russia is reasserting itself. There are fears of new flashpoints in Europe. The Baltic has become one of the front lines of what feels like a new Cold War. As Russia pushes for greater influence, I ask its leader how he sees his country. But will a global pandemic curb the Kremlin's global ambitions? We are now facing a totally different Russia, a totally different Putin and a very weakened regime. I'm on a journey that will take me back to 1989 and across Europe to find out what it was like for Moscow to lose an empire and what Russia is doing to rebuild its power. <laughs> Moscow. It's a city that oozes empire. From the skyscrapers of Joseph Stalin, to the residents of the Tsars. The message is unmistakable. This is a country with ambition. Throughout its history, Russia has had an unswerving belief in its own greatness. You can see that in the Kremlin. This is stunning. Look at this. This says power, omnipotence. This says empire. By the end of the 19th century, the Russian Empire spanned one-sixth of the surface of the world. Inside the Kremlin, you can really feel the imperial ambition which has driven Russia for centuries. For example, all these double-headed eagles, Russia's national emblem, that symbol is straight out of the Byzantine Empire. And over there you can see the throne of the Russian Emperor, the Russian Tsar. That word, Tsar, comes from Caesar, the Roman Empire. And till this day, there are Russians who will tell you that the natural successor to the great empires of Rome and Constantinople is Moscow. Russia never was a normal country. Russians do not know how to live in a normal country. Russia was built as an empire. Russia has existed as an empire because the essence is we are great, we have to have areas of influence, and we have to have buffer states between ourselves and the outside world. So this is an empire. It was communist Russia that would acquire the mother of all buffer zones. In World War II, as the Red Army pushed Hitler's troops back, Central and Eastern Europe fell under Moscow's control. On paper, most of these countries were independent. In reality, the Kremlin called the shots in what was now the Soviet Empire. As Cold War set in, this buffer zone not only gave Moscow a sense of security, it made it a superpower. Until 1989. This was the year people power brought down the Iron Curtain. Across Europe, communist regimes fell like dominoes. Even parts of the Soviet Union itself were now openly defying the Kremlin. Событие за неделю. Факты, 
комментарии, телемосты, информации. Viewed from Moscow, these events were earth-shattering. You could feel a giant empire tearing at the seams. In 1989, I was a student in Moscow. I was studying Russian here. And I can remember that every night I'd sit down to watch the television news. And what I saw, what millions of viewers here saw, was truly remarkable. The Soviet Empire falling apart, piece by piece. Could what happened then explain Russia now? I've spent nearly 30 years living and working in Moscow. And what I see is a country that's still struggling to come to terms with the loss of its empire. People often ask me, why does modern Russia do what it does? Why does it meddle in other countries' elections and launch cyber attacks against the West? Why does Moscow seem so keen to play the role of geopolitical spoiler? I think that the key to deciphering Vladimir Putin's Russia lies in 1989. To understand today's Russia, first, you need to understand what Moscow lost 30 years ago, what it lost in terms of power and prestige, in terms of empire. There was one place in Europe where Moscow found its loss of empire especially painful. In what was communist East Berlin, there is a Soviet war memorial and a cemetery. 7,000 Red Army soldiers are buried here. In total, the Soviet Union lost 27 million people in World War II. That scale of sacrifice, Moscow believed, gave it the moral right to make part of Germany part of the Soviet Empire. So what it says here is eternal glory to the soldiers of the Soviet army who gave their lives in the battle to liberate humanity from the slavery of fascism. In other words, it was the Red Army that saved the world. Moscow turned East Germany into a fortress. Today, there is something ghostly about the Soviet legacy. Red Army bases lie abandoned, haunted by memories of communism, monuments to a fallen superpower. This is Wunsdorf, near Berlin. It was used by the Nazis and then seized by the Soviets. It was the Red Army's largest base outside the USSR. The soldiers called it Little Moscow. East Germans knew it as the Forbidden City. The scale of the Soviet military presence in East Germany was staggering. There were 800 garrisons here and half a million Soviet troops. But then again, for Moscow, this was its key outpost in Europe. And its East German comrades were happy to play host. Besatzungsmacht hin, Besatzungsmacht her. 
wir haben die sowjetischen Truppen auf unserem Territorium immer als Freunde betrachtet. Ich liebe Russland. Ich liebte die Sowjetunion. Die Sowjetunion hat an der Wiege der DDR gestanden. Und die Sowjetunion hat leider auch am Sterbebett der DDR gestanden. The Wunsdorf Base feels suspended in time. There are places here where the Soviet past comes to life. Oh wow, look at this. This is amazing. This says Berlin Operation 1945. This shows the Red Army's last major offensive at the end of World War II. So these arrows, this is the Soviet troops advancing on Berlin. Communist Russia thought its ideas, its ideology, would bind East Germany to Moscow forever. But it was wrong. When the Berlin Wall fell, everything changed. Within a year, East and West Germany had reunited. Moscow agreed to withdraw its troops. С чувством большой исторической несправедливости, что пришли вместе, а уходим одни. Страна, которая внесла основной вклад в разгром фашизма, ушла, а те остались. Вопрос? Anton Tirentiev was the commander at Wunsdorf. Now he's back from Moscow for an official event commemorating Russia's withdrawal. The general tells me he was the last Russian soldier to leave Germany. Западные политики, что НАТО не подвинется на восток ни на один шаг, что будет мир и спокойствие. А подошли не только к границам, подошли к забору, мало того, к воротам. И еще возмущается, что мы их не открываем. The fall of the war didn't only have consequences for Soviet soldiers but Soviet spies, too. In the first file, um, there is the past of Vladimir Putin. With his pass, he could go in the Stasi building here in Dresden because he, he was a liaison officer between the KGB and the Stasi. In Dresden, this archive keeps the records of East Germany's secret police, the Stasi, and the documents of KGB officers who operated here, like Vladimir Putin. And here we got a photo where you can find Vladimir Putin. Where is he? Oh, maybe oh you found on the him. end? Yes. Wow, it's amazing to think that this grey figure at the end went on to become president of Russia. Astonishing. In December 1989, a crowd stormed the Stasi offices in Dresden and took control. A small group of protesters moved away from the Stasi building and came here. This is where the KGB headquarters were. And inside the building was Vladimir Putin. So what did Major Putin do? Well, he telephoned the local Soviet tank commander to ask for urgent backup. But the message which came back was this. I've asked Moscow to sign off on that, but Moscow is silent. That was the moment that Vladimir Putin realized his motherland had abandoned him. Это было раньше Сталин Али. Это Сталин Али. Да, да, Сталин Али. А потом 
Egon Krentz says that Moscow abandoned him too. He claims that at this meeting, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev assured him German reunification wouldn't happen. He accuses Gorbachev of surrendering to America. Und er hatte mir vorher am 24. November eine persönliche Botschaft geschickt, in der er mitteilte, dass er vorhat, auf dieser Beratung mit Bush den Kalten Krieg für beendet zu erklären. Aber das wurde dann zum Bumerang. Er erklärte gegenüber Bush, wir sind der Meinung, der Kalte Krieg ist zu Ende. Und Bush sagte, und wir haben ihn gewonnen. Das heißt, die Erklärung Gorbatschows über das Ende des Kalten Krieges war zugleich eine amerikanische Demütigung der Russen, die den Kalten Krieg für beendet erklären, aber als, Nieder äh, als Niederlage empfunden. Ja, wurde schon. Вам покажется, что я все мерзенно делаю, а я сейчас еле устаю. Mikhail Gorbachev rejects criticism of his leadership. He's fiercely proud of his role in ending the Cold War. Выработала точка зрения такая вот так, без крови. Не допустить, чтобы огромное дело, касающееся немцев, нас, всей Европы, всего мира. Это ваше решение. На политбюро. Чтобы не допустить это. Я должен сказать, были обращения. Не очень хотели объединения. Да даже Маргарет Тэтчер. И, конечно, и французы хотели. Мы заявили, что мы не будем вмешиваться. Это дело немцев. Пусть они решат. It would take Moscow four years to bring all its troops home. But to what kind of a country were they coming back? The Soviet Union had gone. Russia was struggling. The returning soldiers were low priority. Guardiska. Vyacheslav had commanded a tank battalion in Germany, the 16th Guards Division. Its mission, he says, was to defend the motherland and Moscow's allies in Eastern Europe. They were an elite unit, but there was nothing elite about the conditions to which they returned. There were no facilities, there was no accommodation, nowhere for their families to live. It was almost as if they'd been forgotten. Техника, Конечно, шок. Даже и то, что семей не было год. Многие семьи пораспадались, потому что не все это выдержали, как говорится, трудности. You know, I think that in many ways. Vyacheslav's story encapsulates what happened to his country after 1989. 
the Soviet Union, this giant superpower, suddenly found itself dumped on the sidelines of history. And as a result, Russia felt abandoned, it felt lost, and it felt humiliated. Perhaps if the end of the Cold War had brought instant prosperity to people here, then maybe this loss of status, this loss of empire, would have been easier to swallow. But it didn't. The 1990s brought economic chaos and widespread poverty. So what you had here, in effect, was a fertile soil for any strongman promising to make Russia great again. Enter President Vladimir Putin. He's been trying to erase the memory of Russia's humiliation and to celebrate more glorious chapters of its history. Like the victory in World War II. It's the annual Victory Day Parade in Moscow. You know, there are 13,000 Russian troops marching across Red Square right now, making a lot of noise. It's an incredible showcase, really, of modern Russian military might. This isn't just about celebrating a victory in the past. It's very much about the present. It's about Vladimir Putin showing his people and the world that Russia has bounced back that it's a country that wants to be respected, to be feared, and to be counted. In Vladimir Putin's Russia, 1945 is at the heart of the national idea. Sometimes, these symbols of the past make it feel as if the Kremlin dreams of bringing the Soviet Union back to life. But modern Russia isn't simply reinventing the USSR. Its methods are different. These people in the Kremlin do understand that idea of restoration of the former superpower is, is impossible. But they have other idea, and the idea is to be a blackmailer, to be producer of mischief, to be the grand spoiler in the world, to be the nightmare for the neighbors and for the outside countries. So this is the new idea of superpower and, and empire. In the next episode... The mischief begins. How Russia has been flexing its military muscle. The main problem of Russia is that they still believe in the idea of spheres of influence and spreading disinformation. Adolf Hitler is more popular than Harry Potter. It's absolute fake. You're pushing the Kremlin's narrative. Beyond the smiles, a new standoff with the West. It's a colossal but Power games in a pandemic. Russia playing geopolitics. But now, problems at home. He's frozen, he's stalled, he cannot react, he cannot say anything. As COVID-19 hits, will a virus rob President Putin of his ambition to restore Russia's greatness?